very glad to introduce a Key West favorite, Mr. Les Standiford. He's the author of critically acclaimed books, including Last Train to Paradise, Meet You in Hell, and Bringing Adam Home. The man who invented Christmas was in New York Times editor's choice and was made into a feature film starring Christopher Plummer and Dan Stevens in 2018. He is a professor of English and founding director of the creative writing program at Florida International University. Les, am I allowed to say about your award? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sometimes Please. they want you to keep year. a secret to a certain date. He just won the Florida Book Award for the book he'll be talking about tonight, wow. Battle of the Big Time. Books will be available for purchase and signing after the talk. Welcome. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be in Key West, I can assure you. When I first moved to Florida after 11 years in El Paso, I remember saying, uh, I liked El Paso well enough, but I've looked around one day and I said, if I don't see some water and a tree pretty soon, I'm just going to die. I'm going to shrivel up and die. And where did I go? From El Paso, Texas, which is one of my friends said, is not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. <laughs> where did I come? But South Florida. came to uh, Miami and of course uh, the first place that uh, and now my bride of 40 two years, uh, Kimberly and her friend Debbie Delaney said, we've got to go to Key West, and off we came. And It's been a part of my life in, in South Florida ever since. So every time I have a chance to come back here, and particularly now that I've started to publish books and I've written some books about uh, Key West. In fact, my I had ten uh, novels before I got into history, out of mystery and into history. And my favorite of those is a John Deal book, He's a, a building contractor, a South Florida building contractor. The joke is he's an honest South Florida <laughs> building contractor. He uh, comes to in, uh, in uh, um, Bone Key, which some of you know is a, a, a synonym for Key West. In Bone Key, he comes down and, and gets involved in trouble down here, wine, women, and song in Key West, what's not to like. Uh, so it's one of my favorites. So if you, you, uh, I don't know if the library has it or not, but it's still in print, as a matter of fact. Testament to my uh, enduring fascination with this place. I uh, heard that the circus was going to come to an end in 2016. The news came out, and Kimberly and I went to the final uh, combined Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, Greatest Show on Earth presentation out in Nassau Coliseum in May of 2017. And Kenneth Feld, who'd been running the show for a number of years after his father, Erwin Feld, had bought it back in the uh, late 1960s from the Ringling heirs, came out with his family, uh, geez, children and grandchildren, there must have been 50, 60 members of the Feld family there, looked like a small school graduating class, and he talked about what a labor of love it had been to try to keep the circus going for the last half century. It had been, I liken them to the Harlem Globetrotters uh, that had been, you know, they're still around, but, but not the, the grand outfit that it used to be. And uh, Feld talked about that, how he and his whole family had become enamored of the circus, how important it was to them, <clears throat> to his father, and then to him, and to his family in turn. And they'd been able to keep it going as a kind of shoestring operation for most of those 50 years until the previous year, 2016, when they finally retired the elephants. Uh, bowing to pressure from animal activists, they let the elephants out to pasture. And he said that was it. Attendance fell off the side of a cliff. It was no longer financially feasible, very labor-intensive show, the circus. Uh, it's like moving a small town uh, from place to place 
every night or every two or three nights and uh, costs a lot of money to make that thing go and they they just couldn't keep it going after the elephants uh, went away and it's uh, <clears throat> makes P.T. Barnum particularly prescient you know, he's credited for saying that there's a sucker born every minute, but he never said that. There was someone else who was uh, sad that Barnum had beat him out over the Piltdown Man uh, years before. And uh, that was his complaining statement, but it wasn't Barnum that said that. But Barnum did say uh, this, uh, he said, when attempting to entertain the American public, it is best to have an elephant. <laughs> and, and those words proved in 2016, they proved pretty prescient. Well, I, obviously I'd had love for the, the circus for a number of years, uh, for my youth. Uh, was sad when I heard the circus was going to uh, uh, go out of business, the circus as we know it. There's still some vestiges, so I'll talk about that a little later. But uh, uh, we went out to that, that final presentation, listened to Feld, saw, it was a full house, 20,000 people in that Coliseum, many of them dressed up like their favorite performers, and uh, just really sort of amazing and sad at the same time to see it all end. And I wanted to write the book somewhat out of nostalgia, uh, and, and to pay homage to my own feelings about the circus. But I suspected that the circus had not stayed the principal form of American popular entertainment for 150 years simply because some people were going to have sad feelings about it when it, when it passed away. I thought uh, there was more to it than that. And as I did the, the research for the book, it became clearer to me that there was more to it than elephants and clowns. And, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to, uh, I was invited to write a piece for the uh, Washington Post to coincide with the uh, appearance of this book last summer. And I'm going to uh, I'll just share with you the director's cut of that. They took some stuff out. Silly people. <laughs> it's not much longer, but you're going to get everything. Maybe this will explain what I'm talking about when I said there was more to it than that. Given the rapidity with which popular entertainment technology has progressed over the past century, from movies to talkies to television to VHS, radio, uh, PC, gaming consoles, and cell phones, it is all the more remarkable that for much of the prior century, one entertainment platform all by itself dominated the attention of the American public. The American Circus, its ultimate incarnation being the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey combined shows, rose to such height that the cry, the circus is coming to town, once signaled a fourth major holiday, equivalent with Thanksgiving, Christmas, and the 4th of July. Shops, public offices, and schools closed, and an entire populace assembled to witness the parade of bands, clowns, exotic animals, and bejeweled performers marching from the rail yards to the circus grounds, paced by the aromatic elephants and shrieking calliope music all the way. The circus roots extend all the way back to Greek and Roman times, where emperors stalked wild beasts in colosseums to the delight of crowds, and it was revived in Turkey in the Middle Ages by acrobats walking ropes stretched from one ship's mast to another. British equestrians found gainful employment after life in the Cavalry Corps by performing impossible feats of horsemanship inside a carefully measured ring, and that's 42 feet in diameter to this day, which maximizes the centrifugal force that keeps a rider pinned to the top of the mount. In American audiences, George Washington among them, took delight in early shows featuring little besides horses and riders, an occasional juggler or tumbler, and the necessary clown who did stand-up or slapstick while the next act was being prepared. The wildly diverse indigenous American circus began to take its essential shape in the early 1800s when elephants not seen in the U.S. before 1796, were added to the troupe. 
Trained dogs, pigs, goats, ponies, even lions and tigers aside, the, cheer, the sheer size of an elephant is enough to convey the essential appeal of the circus, its impossibleness. What drew audiences of seven to 10,000 beneath the big top, erected day after day and whistle stop after whistle stop, was the prospect of seeing actual human beings convorting upon the backs and heads in the mouths of animals from the storybooks, performing Walenda born feats of daring on swings and slender wires a hundred feet or more aloft, a non-stop array of action arrayed in and above two or three rings, all of this death-defying activity punctuated by such astonishments as automobiles soaring into loop-the-loops and elephants performing ballet choreographed by Balanchine, the gone-mute clowns cavorting all the while. In a recent television episode, Simon Cowell, one of the hosts of America's Got Talent, watched an acrobat stack himself step by step atop a set of chairs and stools that grew to half a dozen or more, concluding the act by balancing high above stage, upside down on one hand, and twirling a hula hoop from about an ankle. Cowell rose to his feet, applauding and gushing. I've never seen anything like that. Well, clearly, he had never been to the circus where transcendence like that was the order of the day. That quality of transcendence, it appears, is what made the circus the phenomenon that it was for so long in the United States, which was a political, and is, a political and social institution that itself was the representation of sky's the limit thinking. The circus in this country came into being at the same time the nation itself was coming into being, and while the mere pageantry and delight evoked by the dozens of troops that crisscrossed the advancing frontier on the heels of the advancing railroad might have proved diversion enough, but crowds came away from a three hours immersion in the circus bolstered by one unequivocal message. Anything is possible. Simply put, the circus was a portable manifestation of the American dream, laid out in terms that most found impossible to resist. Uh, here I'm quoting from the novelist Hamlin Garland, uh, Boy Life on the Prairie, published in 1899. To go from the lonely prairie or the dusty cornfield and come face to face with the amazing aggregation of worldwide wonders, he said, was like enduring the visions of the apocalypse, a glittering river of Elysian splendors emptying itself into the tent. By the 1920s, however, even after John Ringling and his brothers had subsumed the operations of James Bailey and P.T. Barnum into their unquestioned greatest show on earth, inroads were being made. Film had progressed from moments-long diversions presented in arcades into gripping dramatic spectacles where audiences watched in air-conditioned comfort as seas were in fact parted, bushes did burn, and the dead rose to delight or terrorize the living. Furthermore, the advent of the automobile made Americans mobile and independent, able to choose and travel to any number of diversions for their entertainment. By the time television became ubiquitous in the 1950s, the writing was on the wall. The Feld family, who purchased the combined shows from Ringling Ayers in 1967, made a go of it for another half century, but in May of 2017, the show, its elephants dropped two years before as a result of mounting pressure, pressure from animal, act, animal activists, was closed for good. Good riddance might have been the epitaph written for the circus by some, but then again, our world has come increasingly to reflect a historical thinking. Many determined to judge past action solely from the context of the present. Hindsight's always 100% accurate. Yeah. Sem semiologist Paul Boissac, however, contends that the circus is among, quote, the major achievements of mankind, both societal 
an individual. And he argues that any dismissal of it's important as a result of what he calls hasty judgment and limited experience. Shortly after his death of a stroke in 1891, Louis Cronenberger wrote of P.T. Barnum, with the exception of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, the individual with the greatest impact on American lives is P.T. Barnum. Wasak and other social commentators suggest that the traditional circus performance, in fact, represents a microcosm of the known world, one that is grasped intuitively by audiences within a greatly condensed period. Children, Brasak and others say, are particularly pleased by what are they term the transgressive actions of many of the acts. A horse makes a fool of his trainer. An elephant propels an acrobat aloft with a stomp on one end of a teeter-totter. A clown infuriates a ringmaster, trying to, to get him out of the way so the show can go on. Some theorize that certain adults dismiss the circus for these very reasons, as lowbrow, uh, because in a very sophisticated manner it threatens traditional notions of order. People used to argue the same thing about Jerry Lewis. You know, some people loved him and other people couldn't stand him for the very same reason. Kenneth Feld points out that in direct contrast to film and computer-generated illusions, however, all of the impossible things that you see in the circus are real. It's not a magic show. There are no special effects. Everything that people do they're actually doing. And that's an, a, a, an important distinction for young people, I believe, who might easily, easy, and I think they do, confuse genuine human aspiration and capability with the ability to wipe out alien invaders with a death ray or leap over tall buildings in a fast car. Whatever might, one might think of such assessments, one observation seems inarguable. The loss of the circus, which combines the exoticism of far-off lands, the athleticism of Olympic athletes, the spectacle of Broadway, and the drama of a lives-at-risk thriller, makes us a more lonely people. Cultural historian Ernest Albrecht laments the fact that technological advancement has resulted in ever-increasing delivery of entertainment directly into homes and even phones, where diversion often becomes a solitary act. As a result, Albrecht says, there will be fewer and fewer opportunities to come together with others to create that special group known as audiences. And while the importance of the audience in a society's ability to elevate the worthy and dismiss fakes and charlatans is a subject for another day, suffice it to say that without the fellow members of an audience to turn to, who is there to celebrate with? Did you see that? Did that really happen? Who else will check the math of our existence? So that's what I came to think about the more important uh, aspects of the circus. I, lest you think it's a philosophical treatise, I would like to share with you just one little, one short uh, piece about uh, this one. Focus about uh, on John Ringling, who's our own Florida John Ringling. You know. Um, Ringling, uh, toward the end, fell on some hard times. He lived uh, with his nephew in the uh, Cotizan, which if none of you have ever been to the Ringling Museum uh, over in uh, Sarasota, put it on your bucket list. It's amazing. There's a house that's t uh, tremendous. There is a circus museum that's amazing. And then there's one of the finest collections, uh, individual collections of Renaissance art in all the world that's housed there. Uh, all of it today run by Florida State uh, University. So if you can, 
I, uh, if, if I can, if you can get over there, I, I recommend it to you. Now, well, let's see if I can find this. A little piece of paper fell out. <laughs> oh, that little piece of paper. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, God. One, uh, one biography was of Ringling was written by John Ringling North, his nephew, who later took over operations of the circus until it was sold to the uh, Felt family. For a while, uh, North lived with his uncle there in Katasan. <clears throat> Even a heart attack Ringling suffered in 1934 did not daunt him long. Though getting together the cash for groceries was sometimes a chore, the two, North and, and Ringling, dined from Spode, China, and drank well-aged wine from Venetian crystal in the elegant loggia, looking out tall windows at the moonlit bay and the distant shadow of Longboat Key, while Ringling spun story after story of the glory days, including one regarding the painting he'd spotted on a hunch in a New York art shop that, purchased for $200 and its overpainting scraped off, turned out to be an actual Tintoretto worth $50,000. One evening during dinner, North went to answer a pounding at the mansion's front door where he found a U.S. Marshal demanding to see Mr. Ringling. North was experienced enough by this point to realize that here was another court summons about to be served. I'm afraid he's not in, North told the Marshal. About the same time came Ringling's voice echoing down the hallway, demanding that the nurse bring more wine to the table. <laughs> well, I'm afraid he is, said the marshal. You tell him I'm not going anywhere. When North returned to the table to advise Ringling of the situation, Ringling waved a hand. Very well, tell him to wait. With North back in his seat, Ringling continued a story he'd begun before the interruption, following it up with several more all the way through dessert, coffee, and leisurely digestives. When the ceremony of dinner had finally come to an end, Ringling gave a nod toward the great entry hall. If you'll give me a hand, we'll go see about this fellow. They found the marshal in the vast hall, with hat in hand, looking a bit daunted by the splendor surrounding him. Any lingering trace of his bluster flittering away when Ringling greeted him as expansively as a duke welcoming his local magistrate, full of apology for having kept the man waiting. Following another story or two and a pointing out of this artifact and that in the grand room, Ringling ultimately accepted the papers from the marshal who by that time seemed almost apologetic for his errand. Ringling ushered the man out into the night with a hearty farewell, closed the door behind him, and turned to tuck the papers away in his coat with a wink at his nephew. Whatever was written on those papers, North understood the eyes of John Ringling were unlikely to ever fall upon it. Uh, that's the way that uh, I write history. I try to bring it alive. I try to uh, create a story. I try to make it about uh, people. And uh, the ideas come through in, uh, oh, from behind the scenes, let's say, uh, in terms of what happens. As much as I, well, you know, I wrote uh, ten novels before I began to write history. When I first began to write Last Train to Paradise, the first one of these, which is about the railroad coming down to uh, Key West from Miami, I started three or four times and I had a mountain of notes, uh, material on my desk. And each time, each, each faulty attempt, uh, I would quit and say, you know, I'm writing the world's longest encyclopedia article. I'm boring myself to death. The result's going to be the same on an audience. But, you know, I had been signed a contract to do this and I said, what are you going to do? Les, what are you going to do? And finally, a voice came to me and said, well, you know how to tell a story. You've written ten novels. Tell this story. It's as good as any of those. The richest man in the world undertakes the engineering challenge of a century, and the worst storm in history blows it all away. <coughs> well, I thought that was about as good as anything I could dream up. <laughs> and so I sat down and took that material and arranged it in that form and told that story to make anything up. I didn't need to. I had it all. 
did not need to make anything up. I just told it, the, I wrote it the way I would have written a novel. I mean, everything is, is true, and it was a great learning experience uh, for me, and it's kept me going through a dozen or so of, of the books uh, like this. I mean, you'll, you know, you'll have to tell me whether I'm correct or not, but that's my, that's my hope. I've got a little show and tell. I hope it's bright enough for everybody to see. We can flip through that, and then if you have any questions, we can uh, or comments. We'll we'll chat a bit. Somebody has. Uh, <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure we're we start correcting. Can't do. Can't write about anything I haven't seen myself. Even if it's uh, the the. Uh, I wrote a couple of books about uh, the build up to the revolution and the building of Washington, uh, D.C., uh, to become the capital. Well, it's, those places have changed quite a bit, but I still had to go there. I still had to tread on the land. And this is caught us on there in the, in the background, and it was amazing. Uh, one reason why I see, we've got to go, anybody been there? Any show of hands been there? Oh, good, a couple of you have. Well, you'll, you'll bear me out, I think. It's an amazing place. Not quite as big as Henry uh, Flagler's uh, mansion in, in Key West or Vizcaya, but every bit uh, in its way is grand and interesting. This is a, a shot, I think this is probably from Kimberly's phone at the, uh, at the uh, last show. There's the ringmaster, great big six foot seven guy, uh, Johnny Lee Iverson, who'd been the ringmaster for I don't know, the last 15 years of the circus. He was broken up that the circus was come to an end. God only knows what he went on to do. There they are. I write about them. my favorite act was not the lions but the pigs. And I write about the pigs in the book. You have to you just have to get the book and see. But the animals were a big part of it. There's the ending celebration. At the end of that show, I turned to Kimberly and I said, you realize this is the first night in how many years for most of these people who haven't had to run out of that rain and get on a, a train or a bus or a plane and go to the next uh, show and be ready you know, for the next afternoon and then the next evening show. First time in how many years they had no place to go. This is a great circus, uh, uh, circus fire in Hartford in 1944. The circus is already in hard times. That might have finished it off forever. In fact, the city officials, uh, after this terrible disaster that killed more than 500 people, many of them children, impounded the circus. They said, you guys aren't going anywhere. We're going to take what's there, we're going to sell it off, and we're going to give the money to the survivor, uh, to the uh, victims and the, the families of the victims and the survivors. And John Ringling North, who was running it, uh, the show by the time, went and said, well, you can do that, and I can understand why you would, but listen, it's not worth anything as it sits here gutted. Let us go back on the road, and I swear to you, gentlemen, we will pay every claim that eventuates in this disaster. The city fathers sought it over. They said, okay, uh, go out on the road. We've got, we've got a signed agreement, and they didn't, and within five years, the Ringling circus had paid every penny of every claim that came in as a result of that disaster. And it went along, as we say, until 2017. There's some of the firefighters that day. There's an aerial view of the Big Top. Big Top itself, last time it went up, the last time the circus was performed under the canvas was in 1956 in, in Pittsburgh. After that, it, uh, and this was Erwin Feld's idea. Uh, the big, putting up the big top, moving the big top from place to place you know, within 24 hours was a terrible chore by itself. By that time, the, uh, almost every major city had a coliseum where basketball was being played and uh, concerts were being held. And Erwin Feld had become one of the first rock and roll promoters. He managed Chubby Checker, Dion, Fabian, those guys, and sent them all around. He knew every coliseum that was capable of hosting the circus in the country. He became the booking manager for the circus and then later purchased, fell in love with the circus and later purchased it. This is the first permanent circus structure in the world. It was built, vastly, built expressly for the uh, circus. The coliseum in Rome was used for those purposes, but for other things. The first. Uh, dedicated uh, circus amphitheater, London's uh, 
1777. Here's uh, the chief funambulist in the world. Anybody know what that means? Well, that's what a funambulist does, a tightrope walker. He uh, became famous by walking across one stretch across the Niagara River Gorge, then of course later went to work for uh, the circus. He was, while he was out there, paused there, he, he balanced the uh, balance beam on the wire, then himself did handstands and backflips and so forth for about 10 minutes to delight the people watching from either side. Then he had a coil of rope that you can barely see it there on his right side. He, the maid of the mist was down there uh, below, sort of idling in the current. They tied a bottle of champagne to the uh, rope. He hauled it back up, drank it, and then went on over to the other side. <laughs> the story, story after story after story after story like that, what goes on behind the circus was every bit as fascinating as, as what went on and before your eyes in the circus. There's what a typical wagon show looked like before the trains uh, came and the, and the big circuses started to travel. On the train they went by wagon. And one of the chief advantages of uh, roads in those days were dirt. And with the rain they turned to mud. And that was another advantage to having an elephant. Not only were they entertaining to audiences, if you got a wagon stuck, the elephant would just pull it out like it was nothing. There's, uh, this is James Bailey, the first of the circus mavens. Uh, he was very good at what he did. A circus man grew up uh, within the circus through and through and was the one who put the circus onto the trains. Um, he is the uh, man who teamed up. P.T. Uh, uh, Barnum did not get involved in circus work until 1870 when he was almost 70 years old. Someone came to him and said, you've been a great entrepreneur. He was mostly a, pres a presenter of human oddities, like General Tom Thumb, the short little guy that he took. Not only did he make him famous in the United States, took him around the uh, Europe where he met all of the, the chief crowned heads of state, charmed them all. Barham became wealthy as a person who did things like that. Had a big uh, kind of Ripley's, believe it or not, emporium down in uh, lower Manhattan that was uh, made him a lot of money. And in 1870, someone came to him and said, uh, uh, you're pretty good at this exhibition stuff. Why don't you come into the circus? And he didn't know anything about the circus, but he teamed up with another fellow, got pretty good at it, and then uh, found out <clears throat> that one of Bailey's, who became the chief competitor to Bailey, and found out that one of Bailey's elephants had given birth to the first elephant in, born in captivity in the United States, telegrammed Bailey with an offer to buy the elephant for a hundred thousand or for a thousand dollars to about two hundred thousand dollars in today's money and Bailey instead of uh, selling the elephant for this princely sum ran an ad in the next day edition of every major newspaper in the country saying come see the baby elephant that P.T. Barnum would pay a king's ransom for <laughs> well it was the first time uh, that Barnum had ever been bamboozled so uh, and he decided that Bailey was somebody that was worthy of being in business with him. And at that point, the Barnum and Bailey Circus was formed. And they had it pretty much to themselves for the next 15 years until the upstart Ringlings came along. These are seven brothers who went to the circus one day uh, uh, that uh, dis disembarked from, it was a penny uh, circus if there ever was one, got off a steamer ship, in a paddle boat in, in the Minnesota town where they live, they saw that and they said, this is terrific, let's have a circus of our own. Well, they put one on, they charged a penny for their neighbors to come in, they kept it going for the whole season, at the end of which they realized they'd made $12.87, and they said, we're going to keep at this. And 20 years later, they became the chief competitor to Barnum and Bailey. Uh, and eventually bought Barnum and, and Bailey out, and that became the combined shows. And, and uh, well, they bought them in, in uh, 1907. They traveled separately, even though Ringling owned it all until 1917, and just before World War I, it became Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey combined greatest shows on earth. And it reigned uh, supreme 
until uh, Barnum's, uh, until shortly before Ringling's death at the onset of the Great Depression, and then, as I say, limped along for 50 years after that. There's Barnum with uh, General Tom Thumb. This is the kind of classical acrobatic act that Ringling favored, whereas Barnum was more into the oddity side of things, the strange and the, and the unusual. Ringling actually incorporated a 50-person French ballerina 10-minute uh, uh, episode into the circus, if you can imagine, at a time when most Americans had never heard of ballet, but he thought Ringling thought it would be good for people to find out and, and be charmed by it. And later on, commissioned George Balanchine to compose a ballet that the elephants actually learned how to dance, and the poet Marianne Moore viewed that performance and praised it to the skies. Imagine, oh elephants doing ballet. This is the sort of thing that Barnum liked. A horse diving into a, <laughs> a six-foot tank of water. And there's Ringling in, in uh, later life. He's a successful businessman. That portrait hangs over and you can see it in, in uh, the big uh, life-size life portrait over at Cotizan. That's what the railroad show looked like at its, at its height. Hundreds of cars. There's some of the, uh, the wagons, are, you can see these wagons on display, beautiful carved uh, work, uh, uh, gilded trim and, and so forth, still on display, you can see over, some of you may have seen these, I can remember seeing them when I was a kid. This is uh, one of the great love stories of the circus that uh, we don't have time for me to go into it now, but uh, uh, Fred Bradna was the ringmaster for Ringling for about 30 years, and he fell, he was a, a uh, military, uh, it, it, he was in the Prussian army, an officer in the Prussian army, they went, all went to the circus one night, she was riding a horse bareback and fell, fell off her mount into the stands and he caught her. And they were married, they were married for 50 years. And he resigned his commission in the army, later to become, uh, become the ringmaster. Emmett Kelly, you know, uh, he was one of the, he was one of the, another photo that's in the book is of that's uh, that's before and there's after. Clowns were called Joey's after the first of the great British uh, clowns, Joey's. They used to talk, you know, they used to do stand-up comedy. But as the circus show became more and more complicated, as they had three rings going at once, they didn't need the clowns to talk. They didn't have time for the clowns to talk. So the clowns did everything in in mime. Uh, Carl Walenda, uh, who later died while walking a tightrope across a church square uh, from steeple to steeple in San Juan with his daughter, uh, teaching her at age five to walk the tightrope. Some of the lions uh, uh, and the other creatures doing their training in Florida. The elephants learning how to uh, do their elephant thing. The elephants getting a pedicure. <laughs> Not like your spas, lady. Barnum, uh, the one thing that uh, the uh, the greatest showman was kind of a didn't get much right, but he got one thing right. P. T. Barnum loved his human oddities or freaks, as they were sometimes called in the parlance of the uh, circus back then. Somebody asked uh, Tom Thumb, did he feel that P. T. Barnum had uh, had uh, taken advantage of him? all those years, uh, had exploited him, and uh, Tom Thumb scoffed. He said, if it hadn't been for P.T. Barnum, I'd still be shut up in that back bedroom where my parents had me hidden when P.T. Barnum came to ask about me. And most of the freaks felt that same way. Barnum gave them, and the circus gave them a chance to be individuals earning a living. And sure, some of the people that walk in were idiots and made stupid comments, but they quickly learned to deal with that. The important thing was that they could be individuals. Uh, um, Tom Thumb became a multimillionaire, built uh, mansions for himself and all his family members. Uh, loved Barnum to his Final days when Barnum fell in hard times, he came to him and said, come on, let's do a tour uh, together. We'll raise some money. We'll get you back on your, on your feet. And they did. There's Clyde, Clyde Beatty doing his animal taming. He was criticized for using guns and whips, you know, and seeming to mistreat the animals. He laughed. He said, you know what? 
it didn't matter, uh, a whip, a chair, a pistol, if those things wanted me, I was dead meat. How I really trained them was if I became their friend. They liked me and they trusted me and all the rest of that stuff was just for show, to make it seem like it was danger. Gunther, Gunther Gubba Williams had a different kind of act, of course. He was just as adept. Some of you may have seen him. There's the last raising that big tub in Pittsburgh. Here's one of the, uh, the remnants of the circus, Cirque de du Soleil, which itself has fallen on hard times. We don't know if it'll ever come back to what it was. It was kind of extended before COVID, and COVID sort of put the end to it. Uh, uh, they've been in abeyance for quite a while. But, and there are some regional shows. This is still from a circus that operates out of Fort Bragg. They still have dogs and horses and uh, no, no, no elephants and big cats. But there still are circuses, just not on the, at the level of, of what we had in the grand old days. And there's that Cotizan uh, on Sarasota Bay, as I say. Put it on your bucket list. Well, uh, I think that's enough uh, for me. Let's see if anybody's got any questions or anything they want to talk about. And thank you all for your attention. You've been great.